Welcome. Many people know the name Isaac Newton, and we use Newton's laws to solve many problems in a college physics class. I'd like to share something with you about Isaac Newton the boy. He was born in 1642, and his father was dead before he was born. When he was three years old, he was left to live with his grandmother when his mother remarried. At age 11, he was sent to live with a foster family so that he could attend King's School in another town. He was at the bottom of his class at this school, and occasionally he was teased by bullies. Even though he had a fine memory and a talent for making things, these didn't come through in school. A particular bully approached him one day. Dumb ox, the bully called. Useless boy. He got through this particular incident, but later asked Catherine, the daughter in the foster family, Do other students think of me as slow and stupid like an ox? Catherine said, You are often silent and dreamy. I think a lot to myself, Isaac explained. Catherine teased, That may be so, but if you are so clever, then why are you at the bottom of the next to lowest class at King's School? Isaac had never thought about whether he had the ability to do good work. He took up the challenge. No longer would Isaac Newton be last. He worked his way gradually to the top of his class. Each of us has talents that we've been given. We have to choose to develop those talents and apply ourselves to realize our full potential, much as Isaac Newton did. I'm Dr. Courtney. In this problem, we will be applying Newton's second law to determine the force that a cherry picker bucket exerts on the worker under various conditions. We'll call the force exerted by the bucket F sub B We will specify what velocities and accelerations we're considering as we go along. As we develop the problem, we'll start with a sketch and then make a point-by-point -point plan for how we then will evaluate the problem. We have a worker and the bucket of the cherry picker is exerting force on the worker at his feet. So there's the cherry picker. Because this is a Newton's second law problem, we will be drawing a free body diagram. We will include that in our plan and work, do that free body diagram early on in our evaluation. We're given that the mass of the worker is 76 kilograms. The first step in evaluation, we want to make a quick check of our units, and if we need to convert anything to MKS, we will do so. Next, we're going to recall Newton's second law. Then, we want to draw our free body diagram. And that includes labeling it with all the forces acting on the body, which is the worker in this case. Then, we want to substitute all the forces into our expression for Newton's second law. And since we're interested particularly in the force of the bucket on the worker, we want to solve it symbolically for that force, the force of the bucket on the worker. So far, this is all a uh, general expression for the force of the bucket on the worker. Then we are given a series of specific conditions to consider. So for each condition, We want to substitute those specific values into the expression we developed in 5 and solve for the force of the bucket on the worker. And then for each condition, we also want to report our answers to the correct number of significant digits.
So here we go. As we evaluate the problem, we'll begin with a check of the units. And we're only given one value, which is the mass of the worker at 76 kilograms, which is in MKS units. Newton's second law states that the net force, or the sum of all the forces acting on the body, is equal to the mass of the body times the acceleration vector. Now both force and acceleration are vector quantities. But in the, our situation here, we are talking about vertical forces only. So this can be considered a one-dimensional problem. So let's, for our case, write that F uh, net Y equals the mass times the acceleration in the Y direction. Next, we need to draw a free body diagram. The body of interest here is the worker. We're going to concentrate his mass into a point mass. His own weight is acting down. And what is that weight? It's his mass times gravitational acceleration. And then supporting the worker, or acting in the opposite direction, is the force of the bucket on the worker. So that we can keep our positive and negative signs straight, we need to pick a coordinate system. So let's choose up and to the right to be our positive directions. So we've drawn our free body diagram. And then the next step is to substitute all of the forces into the equation for Newton's second law. So the net forces in the y direction are the sum of all the forces, which we have decided are the force of the bucket on the worker and the weight of the worker himself. And this is equal to the mass times the acceleration in the y direction. Now we want to solve for the force of the bucket on the worker. So that is going to be equal to the mass times the acceleration in the y direction minus the weight of the worker. Now let's substitute for the weight of the worker mass times gravitational acceleration. So that is equal to mass acceleration in the vertical direction minus mass times gravitational acceleration. Can you see where we're going with this? I'm trying to come up with a slightly simpler general expression so that when we get to evaluating specific conditions, the mathematics will be easier. So we have then that the force of the bucket on the worker, we can factor out mass into the front. We have the acceleration in the vertical direction minus gravitational acceleration. Now we are ready to consider the specific conditions. In condition A, the bucket is at rest, well, and the worker. What does that mean, at rest? It means it's not moving. So that implies that the velocity in the y direction is zero, and moreover that the acceleration in the y direction is zero. As we substitute into our equation that we developed in part five, that means we have the mass of the worker at 76 kilograms, a y is zero. Zero minus gravitational acceleration is acting downward. So for us, that means it carries a negative sign. If we calculate this force, we come up with a figure of 744.8 newtons. And we would like to report this answer to the correct significant figures. We're only given one value, 76 kilograms, which has two significant digits. So we will report that the uh, force on the worker is 740 newtons. In part B, we have slightly different conditions. We are asked about when the bucket is moving up at a steady 2.4 meters per second. Um, the fact that we're moving up means that the velocity is positive, and we are told that that velocity is 2.4 meters per second. What is this word steady? Why do we need that? That lets us know that the velocity is not changing. That means that the acceleration in the y direction is still zero. That's important. The acceleration in part A was zero, and this was our result. The acceleration in part B is also zero, so our result will be the same. You can do the math if you want to, but 
let's note that it's the same result as for part A and the force on the worker is 740 newtons. Okay, if you can look ahead a little bit, you'll see that the result for part C is the same. Even though the condition is moving downward, the velocity therefore is negative 2.4 meters per second, but the acceleration is still zero. Therefore, the force on the worker is still 740 newtons. I guess I didn't really need to include that word still in my answer. Now in part D we have a non-zero acceleration. We are told that the bucket is accelerating upward at 1.8 meters per second squared. Now we do need to go and revisit our general expression for the force of the bucket on the worker we developed in part 5. So FB is equal to the mass of the worker, 76 kilograms, times the acceleration in the y direction. Since it's accelerating upward, that's positive. So we have 1.8 meters per second squared minus negative 9.8 meters per second squared. And when we calculate this, we find that the force of the bucket on the worker is 881.6 newtons. And so we can report that the force on the worker is 880 newtons. That's to two significant figures. In part E, we are told now that the bucket is accelerating downward. at 1.8 meters per second squared. Then when we substitute into our equation for the force of the bucket on the worker, we have a negative acceleration for the bucket minus the gravitational acceleration. And this time we get that the force of the bucket on the worker is 608 newtons. And to, is that correct? Yes, and then we can report that to two significant digits as 610 newtons. And so we have considered all five conditions that we've been asked to consider, and we have answers for each one. Before we end, let's assess our answers to see whether or not they make sense. Well, if the acceleration is zero, then the force of the bucket on the worker has to exactly balance out his weight. So the fact that those two are equal and that the force on the worker is the same as the weight of the worker makes sense. Since conditions B and C have zero acceleration, we expect those results to be the same for the same reasons. Now when we have the bucket accelerating, when the bucket is accelerating upward, we are adding force. So we expect that answer to be greater than the weight of the worker. And indeed, 880 newtons is greater than 740 newtons. Similarly, when the bucket is accelerating downward, it is taking away from the force of the bucket acting on the worker. And we expect that answer to be less than the weight of the worker, which it is. However, both of these answers are still the same order of magnitude, and so that also makes sense. Finally, we want to consider our units. So we'll recap what we just said in a minute. But as we look at our units, we substituted values for the mass of the worker in kilograms, and we have acceleration in meters per second squared. This is a little harder. We can't just cancel out units. But we recall that the definition of a newton is a kilogram times meters per second squared. And if you're not sure, you can always look that up. And so when we have kilograms times meters per second squared, kilograms times, in each case, meters per second squared, we come out with a unit of newtons for force, which is appropriate. So our units are good, 
and we expect result from uh, D to be less than the result from part A, excuse me, to be greater than because it's accelerating upward, and we expect the result from part E to be less than the result from part A, and both of those check out. So by doing these assessments on our answers, we have confidence that we have achieved the correct answer.